Good evening, everyone. It is our October Speakers Night for 2023. Welcome to RASC Toronto Centre. We are online tonight, and I am Dr. Elena Hyde, the second Vice President of RASC Toronto Centre. This is our Speakers Night presentation. Uh, please note that this meeting is online, an online-only presentation, and not at the Ontario Science Centre. Our President, Tom Luton, will be talking about our various programs later on this evening. But first, we have a very special event to go ahead and kick off. I'd like to start off with a land acknowledgement and acknowledge that the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Toronto Centre meets on the traditional territories of many Indigenous nations, including the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron Wendat, and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, and other Anishinaabe peoples. These lands are part of the Dish with One Spoon Treaty and are now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis, and Indigenous people from across Turtle Island. As we engage in astronomy here, together, um, we respect, learn from, and honor the deep relationship between Indigenous peoples, the sky, and the earth. Now, uh, to go ahead and get on with our speaker event for today, um, our fantastic speaker, um, we are very, very pleased to have today. And of course, at Toronto Centre, uh, meteors and meteor showers are always kind of a big hit with our members, if you'll excuse the term. And this October 21st and 22nd, we have the Orionids in Toronto. Everyone's already thinking about space rocks, and we're super lucky to have Dr. Margaret Campbell-Brown with us tonight as our speaker. Um, they are a professor of physics and astronomy at Western uh, University of Western Ontario. And she began her research on meteors at Mount Allison University in Sackville, New Brunswick. During her Bachelor of Science studies, continued with a PhD at Western. After meteor-related postdocs at the European Space Agency and the University of Calgary, she joined the meteor group at Western in 2005. And there's a wonderful page over on the Western Meteor Physics Group. Um, her research interests include radar and optical measurements, so both radar and optical, of meteors and modeling of meteor ablation in the atmosphere. So as you might guess with this talk, things may get rocky, but I'm sure our speaker can lead us through this hot topic. Uh, Dr. Campbell Brown, please take it and us up and up and away. Thank you, Alina. Yes, so I'm going to talk tonight a little bit about the research that I do and a little bit about general meteor topics. So just a little background. Uh, in the solar system, there's the sun and there's planets, but in between the planets, there's some leftovers from planetary formation. So between Mars and Jupiter, we have the kind of rocky small bodies that never made it as a planet, the asteroids. And out past the order, orbit of Neptune, we have the icy little bodies that never made it as planets, the comets which sometimes also come to visit us here in the inner solar system. And pieces of these can approach the Earth. So we are here, there's the Earth's orbit. The red dots here are some near-Earth asteroids. The green dots are the asteroids in the main belt. Um, these blue dots are little comets, mostly Jupiter family comets that are circling sort of inside of Jupiter's orbit. And of course, there's even smaller things. So when a comet comes by the sun, the, the ices on it sublimate and carry off a bunch of dust, uh, small rocky particles, and those follow the comet around in its orbit. And uh, so those particles can also hit the Earth. And asteroids, asteroids in the main belt and asteroids near us can collide with each other and produce lots of little pieces. Little pieces don't stay with their parents, but spread out and some of them can hit the Earth. So we have our asteroids here and our comets. And for, from collisions and from sublimation or fragmentation, we get little meteoroids. A meteoroid is an object that's smaller than a meteor and bigger than a grain of dust that orbits the sun. And some of these will hit planets. So if one hits a planet, it burns up in the atmosphere and we call that a meteor. The meteor is the little streak of light. When they're very bright, we actually call them a fireball or a bolide. Usually the the dividing line is the brightness of Venus or so. If it's brighter than Venus, then we call it a fireball. In some cases, if we have larger pieces of asteroids, those can actually survive passage right through the atmosphere and they can land on the surface. So this is one of my favorite pictures of a meteorite. This is an iron meteorite, which is actually on Mars. So this is a, a piece of an iron core of an asteroid which hit Mars and is sitting there on the surface and one of our rovers took a, a picture of it. 
All right, so meteoroids are hitting the Earth all the time. We've got uh, little tiny ones, which are millimeter sized, and they're hitting the Earth all the time. Uh, we have a radar, and you can actually sit out at the radar and watch the little oscilloscope pinging with all of the uh, meteors that are uh, hitting the Earth. Um, we get thousands and thousands of orbits a day. So there's, there's plenty of, of meteoroids kind of in the millimeter size range. These ones never hit the ground, but this is the size range where you get meteor showers if you're out to watch the Orionids uh, on the, the 21st-ish or the Geminids in December if it's clear, which it hardly ever is in December, but um, and not too cold. The Geminids are a great meteor shower and they're in this sort of range. If we look up on the size regime, th these ones are mostly cometary. If we go up a little bit larger, we're looking at mostly asteroidal material. And about once a week, the Earth gets hit by something the size of a boulder, something that makes it to the ground. Um, every century or so, something the size of a building hits the Earth. And then you get things like this is the Tunguska impact in, uh, that happened in 1908, although this picture was taken about 20 years later. Very remote area of Siberia but the trees essentially were stripped down to telegraph poles, as they called them at the time. The branches were all knocked off by this giant impact. It caused a forest fire. There was a big explosion. So this was a very large impactor. About every half million years, there's something the size of a mountain that hits the earth. Luckily, we don't have any recent examples of those hitting the earth, but um, in uh, 1994, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 hit Jupiter. And you can see one piece of the comet, the comet broke into many pieces, hitting the hitting Jupiter there. And you can see some plumes from the, the hot spots where other fragments hit Jupiter. And that's about the energy that we're looking at there. And then every about 100 million years, you get something that is very large, something that's bigger than 10 kilometers in size. And this causes mass extinctions, like the one that uh, killed off the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. All right, um, so let's look at the little stuff first. So here is a, a little diagram. We have the orbit of the Earth in the smallest red ring here. Um, and then we have this sort of blue uh, oval is the orbit of Comet Temple-Tuttle, which is a, a not too impressive comet. You can certainly see it every 33 years when it comes around, but it's not like Comet Halley or one of the other showy comets. Um, but every 33 and a third years, it comes around, passes by the sun and deposits some more material. The Earth passes through the trail of this material every year. Most years, the Leonids happen in November. Most years, they're kind of a snooze. There's about four meteors an hour. It's not very exciting. But every 33 years or so, when the comet comes back around uh, to perihelion, it brings with it a whole bunch of dense trails of material. And then we can get really big showers. So in 1966, there were probably 100,000 meteors an hour. It was a, one of the biggest storms that's ever been recorded. So this is just a little animation that uh, a friend of mine, Jeremy Vaubayon at the Paris Observatory made. So this is way back in 1500. The comet has just been around the sun and has deposited a new bunch of material. And this little yellow dot is that material. And so if I play this video, you can see the material that was released. And we're not looking at the, the new trails. This is just the one that was released in 1499. And you can see that the, the trail is being affected. Every time it goes by Jupiter, it gets a little kink in it. The meteoroids aren't all traveling at the same speeds. They have slightly different speeds, so they spread out around the trail. That's why we see meteor showers every year and not just when the comet is close by. You can see that the trail really gets twisted with time. So this is why it's, it's hard to predict meteor showers into the future, because there are hundreds of these little traillets which are laid down, each of which then evolves independently by itself. So you, to predict meteor showers, you have to lay down each of these trails and then track them forward in time and see, uh, try to figure out what the activity of the showers are going to be. All right, so how do we track meteors? We have optical systems and we have radar uh, a, a radar system. And I want to talk just about one of our optical systems right now. We have some all sky cameras that can see the really bright uh, meteors and we have those sort of all over southwestern Ontario into Quebec. Um, and we have some cameras that can see very, very faint meteors. These ones are kind of in between meteors. And what we do is we use um, intensified cameras so they can see quite faint. The field of view of our, our wide field camera for this particular system is about 20 degrees in the sky. So that's a, a good chunk of sky that uh, it's not like a telescope focusing on a very small uh, bit. Um, and they, the camera runs at about 80 frames per second. 
when we detect a meteor in the wide field, we then have this pair of mirrors, which can slew very, very quickly. And we have a narrow field. This is a, a very small telescope on our uh, narrow field system, um, which is about a degree in size, and it runs at 110 frames per second. And with this one, we can actually see what's going on with the meteor. We have two of these stations. We have one at Elgin Field at our um, university's observatory, and we have another one just out at a, a random farm near Tavistock, Ontario. They're about 50 kilometers apart. And by looking at the same part of the sky, we can get the whole trajectory of the meteors. We can figure out their orbits, where they come from, and all that kind of thing. So this can see meteors down to about plus five, which is what a human can see on a, a good dark night. So we can see uh, sort of normal brightness meteors. But we have this pair of very high speed galvanometers with mirrors mounted on them, and they can slew at 2000 degrees per second. So even though the meteor is usually over within half a second, we can track it over most of its, its trail. So we can zoom in on the meteor. So here is the, our wide field. I've slowed the meteor way down here. You can see it over here. Meteors are very fast. So I've slowed the video down by a factor of six or so. And you can see this was a fairly nice bright meteor. This is in a wide sort of 20 degree field of view. And you can see the, the meteor is there. It's blooming a little bit, but you really can't tell if anything interesting is going on with the, the meteor as it burns up in the atmosphere. But if we switch to the narrow field, so the narrow field camera now is tracking the meteor through the sky, tracking smoothly. And you can see that this meteor is actually breaking into a number of pieces. And so we can track the individual pieces. And this really helps us to get a feel for how the, the meteor breaks up in the atmosphere, what it's made out of, how strong it is, and all those sorts of things. We've recently added a spectral system that also tracks it, although that one isn't quite working yet. We're, we're still developing it. Our second system is a radar system. So also at Tavistock, um, where our second optical site is, we have actually three radars, which run at three different frequencies. Um, we have, for one of the radars, it's got some remote stations. So about five to 10 kilometers away from our main site, we have just individual receivers. At the main site, we have a transmitter for each frequency. And then this is our 38 megahertz system. And there are, you can see five receiver antennas here. So we have an, a little array of five antennas for each frequency. And that lets us tell where in the sky the meteors are coming from. And then with the outlying stations on our uh, middle of the three radar systems, we can find the orbits of the meteors. So we can tell where in the solar system they came from before they hit us. Now, one, one thing that we can do is we can plot up all of these meteors in the sky. So for this particular plot, I want you to imagine you're standing on the Earth as it goes around the sun. So you're facing the, the windshield direction of the, the Earth, the direction that the Earth is moving. The sun is over there on your left and it stays on your left as, as you move around, always facing the direction the Earth is moving. And looking out of the solar system, that would be over here on your right. And behind you is the, the, the direction opposite the Earth's motion, all this uh, outside of the, the plot. And in front of you, there are two sources of meteors. So if you trace back where in the sky the meteors are coming from, there are two sources that are basically hitting the Earth head on. And they're called the North Apex here and the South Apex here. We don't see the South Apex as well, of course, because we're in the Northern Hemisphere. So sometimes it's too low in the sky. There's another source that's coming at us slightly inclined from above. So these are meteoroids that are on orbits that are inclined with respect to the planets. These ones are actually going opposite the direction of the planets. So they're orbiting the sun the wrong way compared to the planets. And so they hit us straight on. So these are the fastest meteors. These ones are hitting us kind of from the north. There's another symmetrical source in the south that you can see if you have a radar in the southern hemisphere, which there, there are some, but uh, we don't see it, of course, because it's too far south. And then there's another big group of meteors that come at us from the sun direction and another big group that come at us from the anti-sun direction called the helion and the anti-helion direction. So most meteors sort of end are somewhere in these six sources, although you can see there's lots of other radiants that are kind of in between. And so with our, our radar system that calculates orbits, we can actually plot up where the meteors are coming from as a function of time. So this video is starting in January and running right through the year. It shows us where the radiants are active. So these are the apex sources. These are the meteors that are hitting us head on. These are the ones that are close to the sun. These are the ones in the anti-sun direction. These are the north toroidal ones. And the little flashes and thicknesses that you see here all of these are meteor showers that pop up and disappear 
at their particular time of year. And so you can see the, the Geminids right here. You can see the, um, the Perseids. You can see the Ida Aquarids, one of the Halley showers and uh, many shower, many little showers in the, the north toroidal source. But you can see there's lots going on here. You get the fastest meteors in blue here at the middle and the slowest ones in red at the, the edges here. So we actually keep track of these meteors for NASA. And NASA is particularly interested in the small meteoroids because although they pose no danger to us here on the surface, all of them completely burn up in the atmosphere, they can hit satellites. And even though they're tiny, they're millimeter sized, they're going so fast, they're going at maybe 60 kilometers per second, 70 kilometers per second, they can actually cause a lot of damage to a spacecraft if they hit it. And we have so many satellites in orbit around the Earth that we're really concerned with the damage that these tiny particles could do. When they first launched the James Webb Space Telescope, they, they were actually kind of worried because in the first week they got a couple of major meteoroid impacts and they were worried that they had miscalculated calculated the, the meteoroid activity and it was going to take out their mirror before they could do science. But they've repointed a little bit based on our measurements of the, the meteoroid environment and hopefully their mirror is going to last a, a long time. So that's what we do with the, the small meteors. So let's move up a little bit in size. Now we're talking about the, the, one, the meteoroids that are sort of tens of centimeters in size, the ones that can drop uh, meteorites on the ground up to about a meter. And these ones, um, they, they come into the, the Earth, they've been orbiting the Sun on their own for probably thousands of years, maybe millions of years. Uh, they, they come into the Earth's atmosphere, they start warming up, then they heat up and they produce a flash across the sky. And normally this lasts sort of seconds, maybe a minute if the trajectory is really shallow. You can see this bright fireball just coming across the sky. And then at the end, they go dark. And this is at about 20 or 30 kilometers up in the sky. So they're still quite high, still above planes and everything when they go dark. And then for several minutes, they just fall through the atmosphere. So they slowed down enough that they're no longer getting hot. They're no longer burning up. They, they cool off in fact, as they, as they fall. And after three minutes, five minutes, they, they fall down and they land on the earth. And so that's when we call it a meteorite. This part is called dark flight when they're not uh, glowing. And so here is an example of a meteorite dropping fireball. Uh, so the year is 1992, and there is this new technology called camcorders, where people can carry things around that will take video for them. And it turns out that there were about 14 people who were attending football games all over the New England area. So here is a particular video from uh, Pennsylvania. And they were taking video of these football games when suddenly there was a little interloper in the sky and so 14 people turned their camcorders on this particular meteor, all from different directions. So we were actually able to get the orbit of this uh, meteor fall from the, the uh, spontaneous videos. This was the first time that we had got an orbit from casual videos, not from people who were taking dedicated uh, observations. So this was interesting and there was, it, the, the meteoroid certainly fragmented into lots of pieces. Uh, you can see little pieces coming off and most of them go out immediately. But there's one particular piece I want you to look at, the one that's just behind the main piece right here. So this piece right here actually makes it all the way to the ground intact. And when it hit the ground, it hit a car. So there was an 18-year-old girl who was sitting in her living room watching TV when she heard a terrible crash. She went outside and she saw that someone had thrown a rock through her car. So she actually called the police and the police came, the fire department came because the gas tank had sprung a leak and they were worried about fire. So they got it all safe. And the police wrote it up as criminal mischief. Somebody had damaged her car. Um, but then on the news, she heard about this fireball that all these people had recorded videos of. And so she actually called a geologist in New York and sure enough, this rock that had damaged her car was a meteorite, one of those one of those pieces. So the girl actually sold her car as is with the big hole in it to a collector and she sold the meteorite and she managed to put herself through university on the, the proceeds. So it was a story with a happy ending. Um, meteorite impacts happen every few days. Usually it's not where people notice, but for example, in October, 2021, about two years ago, um, there was a lady in Golden, BC. Golden is in one of the valleys in BC, very small town. 
Um, this lady was sleeping in her bed. She was sleeping over on this side of the bed. And then she heard a terrible crash and she woke up and had no idea what was going on. But when she turned on the lights, she saw there was a hole in her ceiling. And then she moved the pillow that was next to her where she'd been lying. And sure enough, there was a giant rock which had come through her roof and hit the floor. And she actually contacted a geologist here at Western. And he was he was kind of skeptical because he gets messages all the time. Oh, I found a meteorite. And he was, yeah, right. And he looked at the pictures and he said, oh my God, I've never seen anything like this. So usually meteorites do not fall near people. They usually fall in fields. You have to go and search for them. But this particular one fell right in this lady's bedroom while she was sleeping in her bed. All right, so that's sort of the, the medium-sized objects. Now we'll move up to building-sized objects. So in 2013, 10 years ago in February, there was a massive meteoroid that uh, hit over Russia. You might remember that the um, Tunguska event that I showed at the one of the first slides was also in Russia. Russia is like the, the trailer park, as trailer parks are to tornadoes, Russia is to large meteoroid impacts for some reason. Uh, it has a lot of area, of course. Um, so there was just south of the city of Chelyabinsk in Russia, which is just north of Kazakhstan here. Chelyabinsk has, is a city of about a million people. Um, and on the morning, just before the sun came up, this is a dash cam video, and you can see there's a very bright fireball. So initially there were some reports that maybe it was a plane crash or maybe a missile or something like that. Now, when I watched videos like this one, I said, no, I'm sure that's a meteor. That looks very, you can see it fragmenting at the end. This is definitely a, a meteor. Uh, and so we've got nice video here. Um, here's another one. And you can see from the, the little map here, this one was actually taken almost directly at the end of the trajectory. So this one is a meteor that looks like it's coming directly towards you. This person is driving down the road and the meteor is coming basically straight at the truck. It was very, very bright. If you were standing under that brightest part, it was actually 30 times brighter than the sun. It was extremely bright. So we knew this was a big fireball, but we didn't think it was anything particularly special. There was a bright fireball. Well, it happens sometimes. But then we saw videos like this one. And so this is a video, there's a, uh, a garage door here. And the, when the pressure wave from the impact of the meteor, the sonic boom from the meteor reached this place, it actually has knocked over this uh, garage door. There's also um, videos of uh, other places. So here is a, this is a glass factory, ironically. And you can see here the uh, the video, the, the flash happens. There's the fireball and the people are wondering what's going on. And uh, many people either went to their windows or they um, went outside to find out what was going on. What was that bright flash? And it was about a minute later that the sound wave arrived. Sound, of course, travels much more slowly than light. And it smashed windows all over the city. So in some places, 50% of the windows had been smashed by the basically the sonic boom from this very large meteor. So here's a, a video of some people who went out to look at the, the trail of the meteor. So there's the dust trail that it left behind in the, the sky, and they were wondering what's going on. And then the sound wave reaches them. And you can hear glass breaking. You can hear the car alarm going off because the car was shaken by it. So this was a very, very powerful event. This was much more powerful than any other meteoroid impact that has happened over populated areas in, in recent memory. Um, so this was a, a huge uh, event. Um, one question that came up right away was, why did we not see this object before it hit us? So this object was almost 20 meters in size. It was a very, very large object. Um, you can see those if they get close enough to the Earth. Um, we, we've seen uh, meteoroids before this. We had detected asteroids even smaller than this. There was a three meter one in 2008, which was detected by telescopic surveys of asteroids and then hit the Earth. Um, but this particular one, so we, we calculated the orbit. There were many, many videos that we could use to calculate the orbit of the, the Chelyabinsk impactor. 
and uh, we backed the orbit back. So this is a colleague of mine, Paul Wiegert, who did, th did this. And so this is the, the impact time. And then what he did was he produced a, a whole bunch of, of meteoroids that all sort of fit within the error bars of the, the measurements. And he traced them back in time about 10 years to see where the object was while we were doing all these telescopic surveys, trying to find dangerous asteroids before they hit the Earth. And he found that basically it was never bright enough. So this blue line, anything under this blue line is bright enough that the surveys could detect it. Anything above the line was too faint. And so basically this object was too faint the whole time for the last 10 years uh, before it, it hit to be seen. It never approached the earth close enough that it was bright enough. And when it was diving into us, when it actually would have been bright enough right at the end, it came from the sunlit side of the earth. So it snuck up on us in the day side so we couldn't we couldn't see it in the night um so the reason that that western got involved with this is we have access to the to this global network of microphones so there's microphones to listen for very low frequency sound low frequency sound waves travel very large distances over the earth so you could hear things that happen very far away and there is a network of sensors for large explosions which is for the comprehensive test ban treaty so in order to, to prevent people from setting off nuclear weapons, there's this network of sensors that detects when nuclear weapons happen. And one of the biggest parts of this network is the infrasound network, which detects big explosions, which produce a lot of low frequency sound. Now we have access to it so that we can look at meteor sounds from it. And so we actually detected the sound from Chelyabinsk and the sound actually went all the way around the earth and then it went back around the earth and then it went back around three times around the earth getting picked up by the microphones until it was finally too faint so this was a massive thing so in the first few days there hadn't been time to sort of gather the videos for people to analyze them figure out how bright the meteor was and figure out how big it was that way so we actually had the first estimate basically within one day we had the estimate that it was about 600 kilotons of tnt equivalent so if you exploded 600 thousand tons of TNT, that would be the energy with which this thing exploded about 20 kilometers altitude. Um, after that, we did some more work on it. We found a slightly better estimate, but it turned out to be just about the same. And then when other people found the energy from the light and so on, they also found the same answer. So we got the, the, the first estimate of how big the, the object was. So how big was it? All of the estimates are around um, half a, a megaton of TNT equivalent. Um, for comparison, in terms of explosions, the Hiroshima explosion was about 20 kilotons, so much less. Um, but the largest nuclear weapon that's ever been tested was 50 megatons, which is much larger. So it's not the biggest explosion that's happened in the last uh, century. Um, its speed was about 19 kilometers per second. 19 kilometers per second is pretty fast, but it's not that fast as meteors go, which is normal. Asteroidal stuff usually hits us at so, sort of on the slower side, and the slower something is, the more likely it is to survive. The original mass of this thing was about 12,000 tons. Um, the diameter was about 19 meters, and here's uh, the a geodesic dome, and there's sort of Chelyabinsk for scale there. And if you were right under the airburst, it was 30 times brighter than the sun. It was minus 30 magnitude right under. Some people actually reported that they got um, burns from it. They got sunburn from the, the object. Um, there were lots and lots of pieces of this, and you can actually buy pieces of Chelyabinsk online. There were They picked up thousands of, of little fragments of it on the snow. But the main mass actually fell into Lake Chebrakul. Um, and so the... It was traced down to about 13 kilometers altitude. The last piece was about um, 500 kilograms. It hit the ground at about 200 meters per second, so you wouldn't want to be standing under it, but it wasn't making a, a crater. But what it did do was punch a big hole in the ice on this particular lake. Um, it was a very strong fragment. The rest of it kind of broke up in pieces, but this last little bit was, was harder. And here it is, in, it took them until October, the bottom of the lake apparently is quite muddy, so it took them until October to locate this main fragment, which they knew was there because of the hole in the ice. And so they hauled it out and it's on display at their local uh, history museum now. Um, it was actually a fairly normal kind of asteroid. It was an ordinary chondrite, which is what most uh, meteoroids that hit us are. Um, the thing that was unusual about it was just its size. It was, it was very, very large. All right, it actually helped us to sort of 
improve our estimate of how dangerous these sorts of impacts are. So um, this is a plot of the energy of an object, and this is the, the diameter of the object over here in meters. So this is a 100 meter object that would cause a lot of damage. Uh, Chelyabinsk is kind of here, and uh, these are small objects that hit much more often. And this is the number of objects that hit the Earth per year. Um, these little points up here, these are for objects which are basically too big. Other than Tunguska, we don't have any data points up here because luckily these things don't hit the Earth very often. But these are measurements of, um, uh, scientists have measured the number of near-Earth asteroids in each uh, size range and then calculated how often they would hit the Earth um, if you wait a long time. Um, but we found that actually in the sort of 10 to 100 meter size range, the impact hazard is actually a little bit bigger than you'd expect given the, the number of asteroids. We're not sure exactly why that there's more objects here, but uh, basically this, this object helped confirm for us that there's a slightly greater risk of getting hit by things which are sort of in the, the 10 to 100 meter range. Um, so what would we do if something hits the Earth? So if we have sort of a smaller impactor, these ones are more likely to happen. Um, so what would we do? Um, if it's slightly larger than Chelyabinsk, so if the object doesn't sort of cool off in the atmosphere, slow down enough and just hit the earth like a, a big rock, um, an object that was slightly larger, like 100 uh, meters, could actually cause a crater. It could be luminous all the way till it hits the, the ground. Um, it, the, the damage would be local. Um, so the, the damage would be like a minor natural disaster. It would be localized like a tornado or a wildfire. It would affect some people very much and other people wouldn't feel the, the effects at all. Um, there are some dangers though. For example, if we didn't see this thing coming and the, um, uh, there was this kind of thing, there might be panic by the, the people who were who were there locally. Um, also, um, these sorts of things tend to be mistaken for bombs and missiles. And so there's some danger that somebody could think that their neighbors are bombing them if they get hit by a meteor. There's a story that during the Cold War, there was a, a very bright fireball over Norway and uh, it was mistaken for a, a, a nuclear missile on its way to hit Russia. And it was just from the, the actions of a, uh, a smart person in the military who said, no, let's wait and see before we sit retaliate and send the nuclear missiles that stopped sort of a world war. So you wouldn't want one of these things happening, say, on the border between India and Pakistan or something or other nuclear nations that might be mistaken for, for an attack. Um, now, when we detect objects that are about to hit the Earth, it's important that we think about the best way to sort of present it. So if you told people that we were about to be hit by a large uh, meteoroid, the panic over it might be worse than the actual impact. Uh, and so, for example, um, earlier uh, this year in the summer, uh, we received a report that there was a 12% impact, 12% uh, chance that an object was going to hit the Earth within two days. And the estimated size of the object was between 300 and 500 meters. It was a huge thing. And it that 12% doesn't sound like that much. But it, when we get alerts that there's an asteroid that has a, a collision probability, normally they're like 0.0001%. And that's something that you'd want to look at. 12% was huge. And so we were actually kind of worried for a couple of days. We're not actually involved in the, the asteroid searching. So we, we couldn't do anything about it. But we did contact someone and we said, what do you think? The, the impact area was not very well constrained, but it was somewhere between 30 degrees and 60 degrees north, which uncomfortably includes southwestern Ontario. So we were not happy with that. Um, the, the guy that we talked to, though, said, we think maybe that it's just an error and we have um, accidentally associated two objects which were each observed outside the atmosphere and didn't weren't really the same object. And so the trajectory is wrong. Nothing's going to hit the Earth. It wasn't actually that big. And uh, it was never recovered, but it also never hit the Earth. So, so we got lucky there. All right, what about a very large, a kilometer-sized object? What would happen? Um, so there would be total destruction in the crater zone and around the crater. So the destruction zone would be about 30 times the size of the asteroid. If the asteroid was about one kilometer across, there'd be an area of about 30 kilometers across that was completely obliterated, which of course would be bad if it included a city, for example. Um, if the thing hit in the water, it could produce tsunami, which could wipe out coastal areas. Um, there have been cases in the past where very large volcanic eruptions 
put a lot of dust into the atmosphere. And this caused, for example, the, the summerless year, uh, which happened some centuries ago. And basically all the crops failed all over Europe and in fact in other parts of the world as well because of this large volcanic eruption, which put dust in the atmosphere and cooled the, the, um, the earth. Now, we're worried about global warming, but we don't want several years of cooling from a, uh, a bunch of uh, dust from one of these large impacts. Um, the, the object, in addition to, to wiping out sort of the area where it lands, um, it can also cause widespread fires. These things are so bright that they can actually ignite forests as they go over them. And so there would be on the side facing this object, there would be widespread um, wildfires. Um, it can also produce large amounts of sulfates and nitric assay, acid. It can produce things that will deplete the, the ozone layer for years. Uh, so there's uh, other long-term impacts to, to think about. Um, also, it would create earthquakes, but honestly, nobody would care very much about the earthquakes with everything else going on. Um, so what do we know about the impact hazard? We are getting much better at knowing how many asteroids and comets there are in various sizes on orbits that approach us. So we can sort of estimate the impact probabilities pretty well. Um, we, we know pretty well how much damage something's going to do. Uh, if we know its size and its speed, we can tell how much energy it's going to have. So the size of the crater, the other effects are, that are going to happen. Um, dust is a little bit trickier because we haven't seen a lot of big meteoroid impacts. So we just don't know how much dust they would lift into the atmosphere. Um, so that's less well known. Um, how would forests and fields and the oceans and so on respond to that kind of environmental shock? We really don't know at all. And then, of course, there's how would our civilization respond to that kind of a catastrophe? Um, there's, you know, what, how would the political systems be affected? How would the economy be affected? We really don't know that at all well. So those are things that, that people do study. Um, so I've updated these uh, a week and a half ago, I guess. Um, these are from the uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA, where they're keeping track of all the near-Earth asteroids that are discovered from all the various surveys. And on this plot, you can see, starting in 1980, all the near-Earth asteroids that have been discovered up to that date. So this is right up until uh, October 9th this month. And one thing you notice is the red things are things that are one kilometer in size and larger. These are really dangerous objects. And you can see that this red line is kind of flatlined. And that's because we are very good at finding one kilometer objects that come near the Earth. And so we found pretty much all of these objects. But you can see things greater than 140 meteor meters. Chelyabinsk was only 20 meters and did some damage. So over 140 meters, that would still do quite a lot of local damage. Um, and you can see this number is still going up. So we are still finding these guys. We haven't nearly got all of them. And then when we include all the little things down to, we've seen things now that are like 50 centimeters across in the in space, um, you can see that number is just going up and up and up. There's, there's lots more that we haven't seen of those guys. And here is all the asteroids broken out by size. So this 800 and change of the one kilometer guys, that's probably pretty much all there is. Things might move around a little bit. We don't always know their sizes exactly. So some of these might be a little less than a kilometer. Some of these might be a little more, but pretty much we know those pretty well. And these ones probably between 300 and 1,000 meters, probably not too bad. But we know the distribution goes up and up. As you go to smaller sizes, there's more and more asteroids. And so we know that we are missing a lot of the, say, 30 to 100 meter size ones that could cause damage. Even some of these zero to 30 ones could cause uh, lots of damage. And here's the, the number discovered each year. So not the cumulative number, but the, the number that were just discovered in each year. And uh, they're broken out by the survey. So here are a bunch of um, past and current uh, asteroid search um, systems. And uh, the Catalina Sky Survey, for example, is still detecting lots. Obviously, this year isn't finished. That's why we haven't seen so many in 2023. But you can see we're seeing lots of uh, new asteroids every year. So what would we do? Um, what if we discovered something that was going to hit the Earth in a couple of days? So if we know the impact location well enough, then we could warn people. If it was, for example, less than 30 meters, we could say, hey, if you see a bright flash in the sky, don't walk right up to your window because it might get broken by the, the sound wave. Just either wait outside for the sound wave or wait inside. And after a couple of minutes, you'll be fine. You can go out. 
Um, if the thing was locally dangerous, it was going to produce maybe a small impact crater or something like that, you maybe would evacuate, but you really want to, to know the position well in that case, because evacuations can be dangerous too. There could be car accidents and so on. Uh, and so you don't want to tell people to evacuate when, when you can't, um, when you can't know for sure whether it's going to happen. Um, if you discovered a larger asteroid that was going to impact in many years, it's feasible that we could see one 50 years or 100 years before it impacts, then you could actually try to change its orbit so that it doesn't hit the Earth. And it's sort of the same principle as, as darts. If you stand right up next to the dartboard, so if you detect the, the asteroid immediately before it hits the Earth, there's pretty much no chance of deflecting it. You, you throw your dart and it's going to hit the dartboard because you're so close you can't miss. If you're standing across the room from the dartboard, a little change in the, the direction you throw the dart will make a big difference in where it hits. And so you could miss the dartboard entirely if you're far away. So the idea is if we're a few decades before impact, then you could do very small things to just change the, the path of the asteroid just a, a little bit. You could put a little tugboat on it with a spacecraft. You could even make a little rocket engine on it by taking, this is a sort of art, artist's conception, you take a bunch of spacecraft with lasers on them, high-powered lasers, and you use that to, to uh, vaporize the surface of the asteroid. It makes a little plume of vapor that comes off like a tiny little rocket engine. And if you did that for a few months or a few weeks, that might be enough to just change the orbit of the asteroid a little bit so that it would miss the Earth instead of hitting the Earth. All right, so in summary, material from space hits the Earth all the time, and most of the time we have nothing to worry about except we can go out and see nice meteor showers. Um, but we do need to keep in mind the risks. Usually astronomy is a, a um, academic kind of subject, but sometimes it comes and kicks down your door. Um, and the large impacts are very unlikely, but we should be prepared. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Campbell Brown. It's a, wonderful to hear about such an exciting topic, and as you say, definitely rocks our world. I'm sure there's lots of RASC members who have been happy to join in the excitement of watching for space rocks on the admittedly currently rare uh, Clear Ontario nights. Um, I believe we do have a few questions coming your way. I don't know how many we'll be able to take, but maybe about 10 minutes worth. So I'm going to pass you over to Emma now for questions from YouTube. Take it away, Emma. Great, thanks. Uh, this first question comes in from Lewis R. Would it be prudent to start placing monitoring stations in NEO and maybe even at L1 and L2 as well? So that was a great question. And actually, the, the great thing about putting your asteroid search telescopes in orbit is you can look much closer to the sun because we're really on the Earth, we're really limited. We can only do dawn to dusk. So we're, we're basically blind on half of our planet. Whereas if we set up um, spacecraft in space, we obviously still can't look at the sun, but we can look much closer if there's no atmosphere scattering the, the light. And so putting a search telescope in orbit would be a great idea. That's great. Um, this next question is, uh, does the Earth's magnetic pole have an influence over what part of the planet a meteorite might be attracted to? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. So meteor orbits are affected by magnetic fields, but mostly only for the very smallest thing. So the very smallest objects do get affected by sort of the, the magnetic field in our solar system. The, the, with the larger objects, they're really moving so fast that they, they don't get deflected by the magnetic field at all. They just, they come straight in. So the small objects can be deflected by magnetic fields, but the, the larger objects really just punch right through the magnetic fields. They don't, even if they have a little bit of a charge, the force just isn't, isn't significant compared to the gravity of the earth uh, when they get close to the earth. Right, that makes sense. Um, this uh, third question comes in from Enya, who wants to know, given uh, three radar frequencies, do they all run at the same time? And if so, how do you keep them from messing each other up? Yeah, that's a good question. So yes, they all run at the same time. And um, basically, they're, they're all linked together. So that they all transmit a pulse all at the same time. And they all turn their listening off when they do that, because otherwise, they'd be overwhelmed by the sound of their own pulses. And then they all turn their, their, their receivers back on right after the, the pulse happens. And they're each listening in their own frequency band. So we don't find that the, the one radar interferes with the other, except 
if something goes wrong with one of the, the radars. So if one of the antennas gets a little broken or something like that, then the, the transmission doesn't happen just cleanly at the one frequency that we want. And sometimes you get noise on the other ones. So if that happens, we have to shut off the, the broken frequency until we can fix it. But otherwise they, they behave nicely. They don't, they don't interfere with each other. Okay, cool. Um, how feasible is it to mine an asteroid such as 16 Psyche? Um, that is a great uh, question. So I have some friends who are um, consulting for asteroid mining companies. And actually, the, the, the first asteroid mining thing that they want to look at, these companies, is um, looking at near-Earth asteroids, because the, the less you have to change your orbit from the orbit of the Earth, the less fuel you need to use. So they're looking for asteroids that have very similar orbits to the Earth, so very close to the Earth's orbit. And they're looking at small asteroids, like meters to 10 meters. So very small asteroids, you wouldn't have to land on it. And the, the thought they had is the most valuable thing that you can mine in space is actually water. Because when you're doing business in, in space, if you want to build a base on the moon or you want to have a crewed space station, you need a lot of water and it costs a lot of money to launch water off the surface of the earth. It costs about $10,000 a kilogram to launch things off the earth. So if you want a kilogram of water in space, that's going to cost you $10,000. So these companies are betting that you could extract the water from these asteroids, even though they don't have a lot, there's still some, and you could sell that for less than $10,000 per kilogram and make lots of money. So one plan they have is to take like a meter sized asteroid, put it in a giant bag. I'm not kidding, a giant bag, heat it up to drive all the, the water out of the interior, collect the water, and then let the asteroid go, essentially. So instead of trying to drill into the asteroid and extract the, the minerals, they would literally just put it in a bag, heat it up, get the water out. It, you could find rarer elements like gold and platinum and so on, but in general, that's going to cost a lot more than mining those things on Earth at the moment. So other kinds of asteroid mining might become economical in the, the future, but people are thinking about water right now. Right. That's very cool. I didn't uh, know that. Um, what are the factors that limit knowing 100% the likelihood of impact? Uh, the main thing is, so for near-Earth asteroids, the, uh, the small ones can always sneak up on us. It's just, it's too hard to see an object that's even something the size of a building. These things are not very shiny. They're kind of dark, like dark rocks. And so it's just hard to see them when they're far from the Earth. And so unless we had a, a, a whole bunch of sensors all around the Earth's orbit, catching them every time they go by, which would be extremely expensive because the Earth's orbit is very, very big, um, it, it's just hard to catch these little guys. Now, the ATLAS program, which is just kind of getting going right now, is specifically looking for these small objects as they approach the Earth kind of on their final pass. And so that's sort of where we might get um, not necessarily completeness, that we we've, we know all the objects that are over 30 meters, but that we could detect all the objects over 30 meters before they hit us. That would be a, a good goal, too. Um, and of course, there's always long period comets. There are tons and tons of, of comets that have periods of thousands or tens of thousands of years that there are no records of, and they could come flying out of the sky at any time and, and hit us. Now, that's much less likely because there's much fewer long period comets than near Earth asteroids, but that's something that really we couldn't find until it was right on its way to, to hit us. That's very cool. Um, this is, I believe, the last question. Um, I have, uh, what is your solution to the Fermi paradox and can interstellar asteroids shed light on this mystery? Uh, that is a great question. So if there's life out there, why isn't it talking to us is the question. Uh, and so there's so many things that go into this. I mean, there's so many planets in the galaxy, you have to think there's life on some of them. And life arose so fast on Earth after Earth became suitable for life that you have to think it's a normal kind of process that out of billions and billions of planets, you must be able to find a few where you, you have the right conditions for life like we have here on Earth. Um, now, there are some some issues like if you are closer to the center of the galaxy, you can build solid planets faster because you have more stars sort of living and dying and producing iron and all those things you need to build planets on. On the other hand, there's also big radiation fields and stars exploding all over the place. So maybe the the oldest planets never got a chance for life to get going because they're in this high radiation environment. And on the outer parts of the galaxy further out than us, the, there haven't been enough sort of star lifetimes to produce enough solid material that 
we can build sort of solid planets out of. So that could be one thing. Another thing could be maybe life is super common and you can find it all over the place, but it never gets past the kind of single cell stage. On Earth, we had single cell life for, for most of history. And then suddenly there was this little re revolution. We had mitochondria and suddenly you can build multicellular organisms. And those are the kind of organisms that are gonna reach out and say hi to other species in the galaxy. So, so maybe that is extremely rare and that's why we don't see other intelligent life. But it's a very interesting topic. Yeah, that is very cool. Um... We actually did get one more question. Uh, would you take an opportunity to go into space, particularly beyond LEO? I, I think it would be very interesting to go to the, the moon or something like that, but I'd want a few other people to test drive the spacecraft before I got on it. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little more <laughs> careful. <laughs> That's fair. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'll pass it back to Elena. Thank you once again, uh, Dr. Campbell Brown. I think we could probably all stay here for a while talking about these awesome rocks. And of course, I loved hearing about the uh, Chelyabinsk fireball. It was very spectacular. Um, we're unfortunately going to have to wrap up for now, which means we're entering the last part of our evening. And so I will thank you once again for tonight and go ahead and hand over to our president of the Toronto Centre RASC, Tom Luton, to finish off the evening. Uh, over to you, Tom. Thank you very much, Elena, and thank you very much to our wonderful speaker. So, good evening, everyone. Hope you're doing well. Hope you had uh, a nice chance to uh, uh, see last weekend's uh, total so or a partial solar eclipse. And uh, let's get on to our announcements. So for those of you joining us here on YouTube, this is one of two types of meetings that we have. Our recreational astronomy nights are usually the first Wednesday of every single month. They're both live in person at the Science Center uh, and uh, on YouTube. And you've just seen one of our speakers nights, which happens a couple of week in, uh, weeks later. If you're joining us uh, live on YouTube, please say hello in the chat. Uh, please enter some questions for the presenters, as others have already done. If you're a new member, please introduce yourself. And if you're coming to us from far, far outside the Toronto area, please let us know where you're from. So our next recreational astronomy night is the 1st of November at 7.30 p.m., as I said, uh, online and in person at the Ontario Science Centre. Andy Beaton will be discussing the sky this month. Frank Dempsey will be talking about variable star photometry using a photoelectric photometer, still valuable after 35 years. And we've still got one more presentation slot available. If you'd like to present something, please contact Paul Markov. Uh, online at uh, Rastorano slash live on YouTube. Then coming up on Wednesday, the 15th of November, 7.30 p.m. online on YouTube uh, is our next speaker's night. Raj Sira of the University of Manitoba's uh, astrophysics program uh, will be giving us a talk. The exact title is still uh, TBA. We'll have that information for you up on our website as soon as we get it. So coming up in events in the Toronto area, uh, Millennium Square Star Party was going to be taking place on Friday, October 20th uh, from 6 p.m. to 11 p.m. Join us for an evening of free public stargazing along the North Shore of Lake Ontario at Millennium Square. Uh, if you have a telescope and you'd like to get a little help in setting it up, we'll be glad to give you a hand and uh, point it at the moon for you. Remember that it's cooler down by the lake and uh, we're still recommending that folks wear masks and please um, uh, disinfect your hands before uh, handling material at our info booth. Please check our website for a go no go decision based on the weather before heading to the square. Coming up at the David Dunlop Observatory in the next few weeks. So uh, also on Friday, October the 20th at 7.30 p.m. Uh, is Astronomy Family Night. Uh, the fees are as shown here. You can register online the links to the registration can be found at rasco.ca. Uh, we have two sessions on uh, the DDO's Planetarium Day on Saturday, October 21st. Uh, the first one is 1 p.m. to 2.30 p.m. and the second one is 2.45 to 4.15 p.m. Fees and uh, online fees are as shown here and online registration links can be found again rasco.ca. Sunday Sun Gazing 
uh, is taking place on October 22nd, uh, 12.30 p.m. to 1 p.m. Again, register online with the links at rasto.ca. And then the DDO Astronomy Speakers Night, uh, Friday, October 27th at 7.30 p.m. in person. Dr. Xiao Han Wu, and I deeply apologize, I know I've gotten that mangled, uh, will be talking about the universe seen in the eyes of a fast radio burst. Again, uh, registration uh, is online with the links at rasto.ca. Uh, just to advise you, there will be a Toronto Centre Council meeting on Tuesday, October 24th at 7.30 p.m. Members are welcome to attend. Please contact myself at president at rasto.ca for details and a link uh, for the meeting. Uh, the CAO is still open. Uh, the snow has not yet started to fall. So uh, operations are largely back to pre-pandemic conditions. Uh, one major exception being that uh, we are having a maximum of two unrelated persons per bedroom who, who, who mutually agree to share that room. Uh, and masking in common area areas is encouraged, but uh, as preferred by those in attendance. Um, we have resumed public outreach events and supervised weekends during the summer and fall. Uh, see the online CAO booking page for details. Uh, please read everything before making your booking. Uh, we're still looking for some volunteers to fill some jobs. Uh, still looking for a volunteer committee chair, a marketing committee chair and committee members, and always looking for education and public outreach uh, member committee members, especially online presenters and telescope camera operators for virtual star parties. Reminder that in order to volunteer, you must first be a member. Contact myself at president at rasto.ca for more details. Just a reminder about uh, RASC membership. You can renew or sign up online at secure.rask.ca. Gift memberships are available for the holiday season. Uh, contact the national office at mempub at rask.ca for more details. And with that, I'd like to wish you all a very pleasant evening. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please follow us on all the forms of social media that we've got listed here. Um, if you're watching us live on YouTube and you liked what you saw, please like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. Be safe and keep looking up. Good night, everyone.